We're entering the, the, the wonderful world, wild, wonderful world of monopoly competition. What's happened is that uh, the words of monopoly and competition have been changed. Uh, they originally meant, I mean, since 17th, 18th century, 19th century, and also in the, in the minds of the ordinary person, the average person, the public. What competition means is competing. In other words, <coughs> rivalry, competing, offering a trying to offer a better product or a cheaper price than the other guy, the next guy in the industry. So it means competing, it means active co competing. And um, <clears throat> this is, I say, what the average person thinks of and what businessmen think of when they mean competition. Also, competition can be potential as well as active. Very important point. Even if you have one firm in, the in, in, in an industry, uh, it could still suffer or be subjected to the rigors of competition because if it, if it raises prices and, and cuts production, Another firm might, might come in and, and I'll compete it. And then it's stuck with the other firm forever. Very important point. In other words, the competition can be potential as well as active. And business firms, what business firms hate like more than anything else is to bring in other competitors. They don't like other competitors. And if they put, if they put production and raise prices to, to enjoy what's known as a monopoly price, they will then bring in with their higher profits will attract more, more other, other capitalists will come in with new, new, new equipment and new plants, new plant, more modern equipment than this firm has. So, uh, which is a, so potential competition is just as powerful as, as actual competition in the minds of the businessman. So you have competing, which is either actual or potential or both. <clears throat> uh, monopoly meant, from the 17th century on, uh, meant a grant of exclusive privilege by the government. <clears throat> Um, means exclusive to either one person or one firm or several firms. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> so, for example, the King of England gave to John Smith the monopoly of production, wool playing cards in, the, in, the, in England, in the, in the Kingdom of England. So anybody else who produced cards was shot with the state of illegality, in other words. Um, why did he do this? So this means that John Smith benefits. And the consumers suffer and potential competitors suffer. In other words, if somebody else wants to go into the playing card business, here's price and quantity pay for playing cards, decks of cards. Uh, if you say that only John Smith can produce it, it means you're, a lot, you're shifting the supply curve to the left and you're, you're forcing consumers to pay more for a, a lower product or a smaller product. And you're keeping out all, comp all other competitors, people who will want to produce cards if they were allowed to do it. So in other words, what happens is John Smith benefits, the monopolist, at the expense of, who, in other words, from a monopoly, who benefits? You should ask yourself this in all cases of government interference anyway. Who benefits and who pays? Um, who whom? In other words, who's screwing whom in any, any act of government whatsoever? The beneficiaries are John Smith, the, uh, the monopolist of playing cards. Okay. The losers are the consumers and the competitors, the people who would have competed. Okay, the excluded competitors, in other words. Also benefiting is the king and his bureaucracy, because uh, what the king does in the old days, the king would simply sell the monopoly privilege to John Smith. That's all. I mean, in other words, John Smith would make a deal with the king. John Smith gets the monopoly privilege producing playing cards for 20 years or something. The king gets paid for it. In other words, he pays the king a certain amount. So the, and also the king of the government um, builds up a bureaucracy. And builds up political allies with John Smith. This, of course, is happening all the time, not just with monopoly, but also with, the, with because cost plus contracts, any contract. Take, for example, the New York City scandals right now, the famous parking violation scandal. Uh, you have a who should get the had a question who should get the computer? I wanted to sell computerized parking uh, ticket violator search machine to search for parking violator. Um, Two people competed, two companies competed for the contract. Metro, Metro, what's the name of it? Metro something. Metro something, which is a, an old, Motorola, excuse me. Motorola is an old, an old uh, the distinguished computer company. An obscure little alpha called City Source, CompuSource, Compu, Compu, Compu right? Nobody ever heard of. CompuSource gets the contract. CompuSource had no money and no, no computers yet. Why do they get the contract? Because Stanley Friedman, the distinguished head of the Bronx Democracy, <laughs> the Bronx Democratic Party, was the, was the <laughs> lobbyist for the contract.
Stanley Freeman had no money, but he was made as, as a return for getting the contract. He received a majority shareholdership of the company. In other words, he got a, a million and a half dollars in shares <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a legal fee. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> became the majority shareholder of a previously non-existent company, which was formed only for the purpose of getting the contract. Okay, so this sort of thing. In other words, who benefits? The recipient of the, of the privilege, monopoly privilege or contract, and the government official. In this case, Lyndon Auer or all these other guys. Friedman, all these guys were on a take. So um, whether it's the king that does it or some city official does it, it really doesn't make much difference. It's... it's the government is in a position of selling monopoly privileges, and the, and the people are then buying it. When gambling is outlawed, for example, which it is, except for government <laughs> OTB efforts, uh, if roulette wheels are outlawed, then um, if, a government, if, a, if a police captain allows a certain roulette wheel establishment to operate his district, and it is on the take from the, uh, from the company that does it, then the, the, captain, the police captain is selling monopoly privileges, the monopoly privilege of operating a roulette wheel in that district to uh, whatever it is, to the, whatever family is operating it. Okay? So this, is, this sort of thing is going on all the time. This is essentially the, the, known as the government industrial complex, I guess. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the defense area, it's called the military industrial complex. It really is it's wider than that. It's the government industrial complex, the government business complex, also known as government business partnership. Okay, so this is, uh, and we'll see various examples of exclusive privilege, uh, the, the taxi industry, the airlines before deregulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, monopoly, the American Revolution was fought largely against monopoly. In other words, against the British government, which had given to the East India Company, uh, which had a monopoly of all trade with the Far East uh, Corporation, uh, gave them exclusive privilege to import tea into the United States, into America. And all the, the Americans rose up against it and dumped the tea in Boston Harbor, so-called Boston Tea Party. This was an attack not only on the tax, but also on the monopoly privilege. The first states, that, when, the, when the first states were created, American states, they, they put in their constitutions outlawing monopoly. What they meant, of course, is not outlawing what is now meant by monopoly in the textbooks. They meant no grants of monopoly privilege by the government. This, of course, is a dead letter, basically, but at least it was in the state constitution to express the fact that the American Revolution was an anti-monopoly revolution as well as an anti-tax. Okay, so this was the definitions of competition monopoly until 1930s, basically, to simplify the situation. In the 1930s, a crazy new theory was, of microeconomics was coined at about the same time, slightly earlier, in Keynesianism and macroeconomics. So we have, what we've had in the last 50 years is essentially a or 30 years, is a process of rollback by which Keynesianism is getting increasingly discredited in macroeconomics and it's none too soon, and also increasing the discredit on this, on this monopoly, this new competition theory, which is still, however, in the textbooks. In other words, it's been rolled back quite a bit. It's not taken as seriously as it used to in the 30s, but it's still there as the alleged ideal uh, competition. Okay, competition. So in the 1930s, competition and monopoly were redefined. So keeping the old terms, because keeping the old value uh, connotation everybody kept on. In other words, everybody was in favor of competition against monopoly. I mean, the American public, economists, intellectuals, everybody agreed competition was good and monopoly was bad. Or if they, if they want to call it in so-called scientific terms, competition is efficient and monopoly is inefficient. But basically, it's good and bad. Okay? And for obvious reasons. So the same value, they redefined the words competition and monopoly and then applied the same old value judgments of the emotional baggage these terms had to the new to a new set of a, a new de, a new set of definitions. Competition was defined as a state of not not competing, but a state of a condition of so-called perfection, purity, perfection and purity. Okay. Monopoly was a state of imperfection, monopolistic, imperfect, and impure. And notice the terms here. It's supposed to be value-free scientific terms. Perfect. Who does, who does not prefer perfection to imperfection? I mean, the very terminology gets you to be in favor of perfect. Who doesn't prefer pure to impure? Who doesn't prefer competition monopolistic? So this is also called monopolistic. And the redefinition was as follows. Competition meant a situation where each firm, not the industry, but the firm, faces a horizontal demand curve, an infinitely elastic Demand curve, 
And monopoly is a situation, or monopolistic, or impure, or imperfect, all the same jazz, is defined as a situation where each firm faces a falling demand curve. That's it. Now, this is a this is really the definition. We cut through all the jargon and all the, all the junk and the, the, the many chapters of the textbooks. Fortunately, Miller has less of it than most other textbooks. Um, but essentially what it means is that a, a firm is monopolistic or monopoly or impure or imperfect. It's all the same thing. If it faces a falling demand curve, it's only perfect and pure if the firm faces a horizontal demand curve. Well, I've already proved and it took me several weeks to demonstrate that all demand curves are falling. So where do we get this horizontal demand curve from? Get it from this in this way. If each firm in an industry is very, very tiny, say the, the model of this is the wheat industry, you have you know, two million wheat farms in the world, and you have Hiram Jones has a, has a hundred acres of wheat in Iowa. If Hiram Jones is a very, very tiny proportion of the total wheat industry, and whatever he does on a wheat farm doesn't make any difference to the price. In other words, if he increases the production by 20%, it's not going to make a hell of a big dent in the total supply. So we can therefore assume, according to the theory, he's facing a horizontal demand curve. In other words, he can increase his supply by 20%. He can sell it at the same price because it makes a very tiny dent uh, on the total. Well, in other words, the model, the ideal which every industry is supposed to face is where every firm is so tiny that it can't affect its price. So regardless of what is, whether it goes out of business or triples its production, will have no effect on price. This is supposed to be ideal situation. Everything else is imperfect, impure, monopolistic. Uh, and of course, each one of us is a monopolist, by the way. Now, each one of us faces a falling demand curve. We're all monopolists, well, every one of us, if we're engineers or economists or whatever. Because if you go out in an engineering labor market and you insist on a higher wage rate, very high wage rate, you're going to have, you're going to see a falling off of the demand for your services. If, for example, you, you insist that you won't work for IBM for less than 500,000 a year, you'll probably get disemployed very fast. <laughs> okay. So this is, in other words, everybody, every, we're all monopolists. What kind of a crazy system is it? Everybody's a monopolist. Everybody except possibly Hiram Jones in the wheat industry. Makes very little sense. Okay, the next point is to try to, to figure out why it is that, co that competition is better than so-called monopoly. Why is it, what's so great about a horizontal demand curve anyway? And, uh, and by the way, the, the, the result of this is all during the 1930s and 1940s, the antitrust division, which is in the, influenced by these economists who have this view, is trying to break up big business into small parts, you see, because it makes, so that to duplicate the small wheat farm situation. So that every, in other words, it's like taking General Motors and Ford and breaking them up into two million teeny little blacksmith shop size automobile plants. And of course, if you had, if you had a million, you know, small, small plants, you know, originally the automobile industry used to be made in, and, and automobiles used to be made in blacksmith shops and bicycle shops when it first got started in 1900. You take, you know, bicycles were, were used to wheel and axle technology. So they'd start being produced, they start producing cars in bicycle shops or blacksmith shops. I think Henry Ford's original was a blacksmith shop or a bicycle shop, forget which. But they're very small. You have to be grinding out two cars a month or something, or two cars a year. That's what these guys, were, the, the ideal that they're setting forth is go back to that kind of a situation. Every, every firm is a, has tiny, teeny size compared to the whole industry. Why is this supposed to be better? That's the next question. Okay, I will now give you the full shtick, the full argument about why this is better, and why a falling demand curve is supposed to be evil. Here's the, here's the, this is, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set forth for you now a series of insane assumptions, all, none of which are realistic, okay, all of which are flawed, deeply flawed, which wind up with the conclusion that competition is better than monopoly. Competition in the sense of a horizontal demand curve is better than Monopoly in the sense of a falling demand curve. Okay, you take, first of all, in, we get now the concept, which Professor Hoppe has already mentioned to you before, final equilibrium, long run, long run equilibrium. A long run equilibrium is different from what I've, I've been talking about, supply and demand every day to day. Long run equilibrium is this. If you're going along, with lots of stuff going on in, the, in business, lots of changes taking place in, in values and resources and technology. If, you, if the angel Gabriel came to the earth and froze everything, like a freeze frame operation, froze all value scales, so no value scales are changing anymore, froze all resources, supply, uh, labor, land, etc., froze all technology, so no new technology, you freeze everything. Then if you did that, in a few years, you'd wind up with every corporation making the same 
long run interest rate. In other words, there'd be no pure profits, no pure losses. Because everything would be the same all the time. Everybody would know that the world will remain the same forever, like an ant heap. <clears throat> so this would mean if data were frozen, you'd wind up after a few years with every firm making 6% interest return, no, no extra profits beyond the regular time preference or interest rate, and no losses, of course. If you could foresee everything, you're not going to make any losses. If you can predict everything in the future, because everything always been, will always be the same as it has been in the last 20 years, you'd wind up with, a, with no profits and no losses. In other words, you'd wind up with an interest return only for every firm. So that a firm which is now making heavy profits, you've got, you know, firms will capital will pour into that industry, computers, let's say, you wind up with usual 6%. Firms, industries which are making losses, firms will leave it. You wind up after this kind of shuffling back and forth after a few years with everybody making 6%, no, no more, no less. 4%, whatever the interest rate is. So you then ge geometrically, you'd have a tangency situation. In other words, geometrically, you'd have, um, this is, uh, you'd wind up with something like total cost tangent to, to uh, total revenue at, the, at whatever the, the production point is. Um, and the average cost diagram, okay, you have your U-shaped average cost curve. And you have a you have a average revenue curve. It, ha it will have to be tangent in final equilibrium. Now remember, no, final equilibrium does not exist. Never can exist. Never has existed. Never will exist. Remember this, because life is not fr you don't freeze the data. The data are always changing. Values are changing. Value scales are changing. Fashions are changing. Preferences are changing. Technology changes. Investment changes. Labor change. Lots of stuff is changing all the time. So you never get to long-run equilibrium. The important thing about long-run equilibrium is to try to tell you to analyze profits and interest, to show you that profits are, and losses are a matter of forecasting and interest is a matter of time, time preference. It's really an analysis of where the economy is going. It should not be taken seriously as an existing situation because it never has existed and never will. But what happens in microeconomics, unfortunately, since the 1930s, Long-run equilibrium has been, taking, has been taken seriously as a not only existing, but, but something which is existing and should exist. Uh, if it did exist, it shouldn't. We'd we all be in miserable shape. We'd be in a state, state of, of stasis. No, nothing had ever improved. Nothing had ever changed. It'd be pretty miserable. It's like, like an ant heap or a beehive. It'd be pretty miserable existence. But anyway, this is supposed to be the ideal situation. Uh, okay, given a U-shaped average cost curve, We've already seen it's not really U-shaped. Forget about that for a minute. Given that, and the falling demand curve for the firm, okay, uh, <clears throat> the demand curve for the firm is falling. It can only be tangent in this area. Just, this is just once, once you once you assume a, a U-shaped average cost curve and a, and a linear demand curve, it has to be can only be tangent, say here. Okay? This, in other words, is the uh, the tangency of the of this firm, this business firm, in a if it if it's quote monopolistic unquote, in other words, it faces a falling demand curve. On the other hand, if its demand curve is horizontal, if it's in a situation where it's a teeny fraction of the entire industry, then it can only hit can only be tangent on this this point here. Given the same average cost curve, remember that. Given the average cost curve as being the same, you then have this kind of situation. Right? In other words, if the demand curve for the firm is horizontal, <clears throat> you, you, you're tangent here. Therefore, conclusion, okay, just as we conclude with a, with a monopoly privilege, if the government excludes firms, you have a, a smaller product at a higher price, thereby screwing the consumers. So these people conclude about the free market or the market in general. The firm facing a falling demand curve will the output will be smaller, and the price will be higher than a firm uh, with, a, with a horizontal demand curve. Just from this diagram here. That's the conclusion. That's it. That's the whole shtick. This is it. That's the entire case for the horizontal demand curve for purity and perfection is against impurity and imperfection. The entire case is that given the same average cost curve, given a tangency in the final low run equilibrium, and given the shape of the U shape of the average cost curve, given the, the, the rest of it, the linear shape, you wind up with a output smaller okay, under so-called monopoly, under monopolistic, and, uh, and a price higher. 
conclusion is, therefore, the consumers are being screwed by, by a monopoly, and therefore, the antitrust divisions should come in and break every firm up into teeny parts so as to get to the bottom of the average cost curve. Now, the many say there are many problems with, it, with this is, is, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is, is putting it kindly. Uh, first place, this how, well, I mean, just one, one question, how big is this anyway? If you're going to the problem, the trouble of breaking out firms, is this like one half of one percent or is it really important? Nobody knows. Remember, all laws in economics are qualitative. Uh, apart from that, <clears throat> if you might be going through all this headache for a very small fraction of, of return. As a matter of fact, some economists have tried to estimate what this percentage is, is something like 2% or something, even at best, 2% uh, difference. But anyway, any rate, that's, that's the least of the problems here. Uh, one thing is, who, who says it's a U-shaped cost curve? As we've already seen, it's not really U-shaped. It's, um, in most cases, the cost curve goes down like this and it's flat. Okay? In a flat plateau, none of this works. This whole thing is out the window. Uh, because, first of all, the, the the intersection point is now the whole business, not just one point. <clears throat> we have a whole range at which marginal cost and average cost are equal. And there's nothing to say. I mean, supposing uh, you have a, well, this would be a flat demand curve like this. But the, the falling demand curve could easily be like that, could easily hit, see, at, the, at this point, go down like that. Don't forget, there's nothing that says that it has to be linear. It can be a little gap in the, li in the line here. <clears throat> and so. You can easily twist it around a little bit and have the thing coincide at the same point as the, as the falling demand curve. The, the, the falling and the linear and the horizontal. Can, if, as long as you're, as you're, as a matter of fact, you can even have it here. You can twist it around a little bit like that. You can hit it at the, at the bottom point. Remember, the linear part is purely, is purely a simplification purposes. It's not, nobody knows that it's a straight line. All we know is that it's falling. So if it's falling, you can easily cut around like that and simply nip in there. And intersect at the same point. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> as I say, with this thing here, with the bottom, with the flat bottom, the intersection point is, is pretty, pretty extensive. It can, it can even more, more, more room for nip in and nip around and get in there. So this really only works if you're, if you're committed to a straight line at all times. And there's no reason for that. If you're committed to a you, one single trough point, there's no reason for that. In fact, there's a reason for the opposite. Uh, Second of all, it only works in equilibrium. In other words, the rest of the time, in the real world, when there is no long-run equilibrium, none of this applies. There's no, there's no way you can say that uh, output is smaller or price higher in, in so-called monopolistic situation. Then you'd have something like this. You have this. So you'd have a point like that. You have something like that, point like that. There's no way to show the price is higher or the output smaller. You can only show that in long-run long -run equilibrium. Since there never is long-run equilibrium, it never exists, this whole thing is pointless. Because okay, this situation, this tangency, never exists in real life. Never can exist, never will exist. So, uh, <clears throat> so this, whole, this whole situation, this whole thesis applies only, at best, to, to tangencies where you, where, you, where you jimmy up the thing so you, 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 this has to be linear and this has to be one point, or, and neither of which is true. And secondly, it only exists in long-term equilibrium, which, doesn't, which doesn't never, never really exists anywhere in the real world. It's purely artificial construction. Uh, and we'd be in bad shape if it did exist. There's nothing great about long-run equilibrium. Uh, also, and finally, and the, probably the most important point here, is that who says that the course curve remains the same in the situation? Who says? Where is it written? In fact, it's just the opposite. If we took the uh, General Motors of Ford and broke it up into 500,000 or whatever teeny plants, each for the size of a blacksmith shop, you might get a hit you know, at the bottom. It's true, but on the other hand, you'd be way up like, on the 10th floor, the non-existent 10th floor. The cost curve would be extremely high because each, each plant would be very inefficient. You wouldn't capture the advantages of large-scale production. So you might get you know, $5 million per car, so that only a few millionaires can afford to ride, which is, which is, by the way, what happened in the early days of the automobile. It was, it was a toy for the rich. And only when Henry Ford and the theory of mass production came in did he say, no, we can have, we can have the average person ride. Just, you have a mass production, you know, interchangeable parts, because before that, the cars were beautiful, except they were very expensive. Only millionaires could ride around, Diamond Jim Brady or whatever could ride around on it. So, uh, so in other words, we could be at the bottom, but the consumers would have, a, would, would have the thrill of knowing that, the, that the, each firm would be at the bottom of the cost curve. You'd, you'd tap, eliminate the so-called monopoly here. On the other hand, of course, you'd be paying $5 million a car, 
because each cost curve would be infinitely higher than the cost curve on a large scale production. So the, the, the rub is to say that the, the cost curve is equal. Cost curves are never equal. And the, and the reason for large scale production is precisely because the cost curve is lower. Because when you get to the to large scale production, you can tap the indivisibilities of large scale production and get down to a much lower cost. <clears throat> so the fact you'd be up here somewhere, happily, happily the bottom of the cost curve is not going to give us much consolation if we pay the five million bucks per car. So, uh, so all this, I think, is, is demonstrates uh, the, fall the egregious fallacies of this whole concept, whole idea that, that somehow, that somehow, perfect competition is better than, or pure competition is better than so-called monopolistic. There's something evil about a falling demand curve. It's not true. Uh, falling demand curves are great. Also, they exist everywhere. They, we always have them, and we're able to tap large-scale production here. So you're much better off than you would be, even at the bottom of a cost curve if it's way up on the tenth floor. In other words, if it's five million bucks per car, let's say. So. Uh, the question is, how does this, how does this whole thing arise? And it's, it's interesting. It was part of the, generally the anti-business climate of the 1930s, where this kind of doctrine uh, became uh, became popular. So, what's been happening over the years is that the economics profession has been slowly rolling backward from this commitment to this crazy perfect competition doctrine, but it's still there as an ideal. It's still listed as the ideal, somehow as the ideal situation. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it'll take quite a while before that gets blasted loose, I'm afraid. The uh, so there we have it. That's the that's the full argument for the uh, for the perfection of, of, of the desirability of perfect competition, the alleged undesirability of falling demand curves. And uh, to say that it's pretty feeble is, is of course, is, is uh, being very kind to it. Uh, so it's almost what's happening now is the economists have essentially stopped endorsing the idea of breaking up all businesses into tiny little blacksmith shop size, but they're still. It's still somehow intellectually committed to the this alleged ideal, largely because you see you can use tangencies and equations and differential calculus here. Because if you if you if you start talking about something like this, the math has to drop out. But this but if you if you if everything is tangent and finite and long-run equilibrium, and it curves are smoothly arcing and so forth, and you can have all sorts of beautiful uh, equations and tangencies. And the graphs are great. As soon as you drop that and bring in the real world, the graphs and the and the equations have to have to be either modified or have to be eliminated, which uh, which uh, reduces the alleged science, the alleged hard science of economics. But uh, of course, the hard science is only alleged. Obviously, the whole thing is a, a tissue of a fabrication of alleged uh, alleged science. <clears throat> so, at any rate, that's the uh, that's the setup, and um, there are as part of the Part of the argument, you see, is that the, if, if in order to have so-called competition, you have, to have every firm has to be very tiny. Goods are given. The, the good is, quote, given, unquote. It means you can't have any improvement, because then any improved product becomes, quote, monopolistic, unquote. Because there's always only, there's only one firm that comes out with a new product or a new, a new invention. Uh, so that, according to this doctrine, say Polaroid is the first firm that comes out with a Polaroid camera, Polaroid process. It makes it monopolistic right away because you don't have a million firms, each one very small. So, uh, but monopoly is good in that sense because without that, you wouldn't have any improvement at all. You have to have every firm would be like a small wheat farm. No firm would be able to get out there and, and invent a new product or a new process or whatever. There wouldn't be any computers. There wouldn't be any Xerox. There wouldn't be Polaroid. There wouldn't be nothing. No calculators. Because everybody would be stuck in the old wheat farm kind of thing where no one firm can do anything. No one firm can be even active as a competing force, much less as uh, doing anything else. So anyway, what I'm trying saying here is that the whole alleged ideal is a, is a lot of hocus pocus. It's mumbo jumbo based on this tangent, a whole series of crazy assumptions. The tangency, the, the given cost curve, the tangency which only exists in the long-run equilibrium in a peculiar shape, a linear uh, shapes and the, and the u shape uh, point. <clears throat> I'm to open the door here. Yeah, the, uh, so in real life, again, what the real problem with monopoly is not the falling demand curve. There's nothing wrong with falling demand curve. There's nothing inefficient or unethical or anything of, of the sort. The problem with monopoly is once again the same problem as we had in the 17th, 18th century, and 19th century, namely government uh, grants of exclusive privilege, either for one firm or for several firms. That's really the situation where monopoly comes in. Cost plus or con exclusive contract or keeping out different parts of the industry and thereby shifting the supply curve to the left, raising prices, uh, keeping out competitors, 
That sort of thing, which always has existed, and always has been the problem of monopoly, still is. Despite this, the, the redefinition of monopoly being a foreign demand curve. Monopoly is still an exclusive privilege by the government. Uh, okay, let's see how this works. The, um, for example, before deregulation of airlines, I mean from the 1930s until a couple of years ago, we had the Civil Aeronautics Board, a beloved institution, um, which was put in by the large airlines, United, Pan Am, uh, in the 1930s, to serve as a cartelizing device, in other words, as a monopolizing device. <coughs> the um, CAV was put, it was lobbied for by the big airlines, it was staffed by essentially people from the big airlines. The idea was to keep <coughs> excluded airlines, to, uh, to sign monopoly routes, and also to regulate the rate so the rate would keep going up. Um, for example, in New York, the Boston had, I think only Eastern Airlines could do that route in those days. Nobody, if anybody else tried to fly from New York to Boston, they were shot. In other words, they were considered illegal. They were excluded by the CAB. The CAB gave certificates of convenience and necessity, I think it was called, to, every, to any airline on any route. So the CAB said, no, you can't fly on that route. You couldn't do it. There was, no, there was no free market, in other words, no free enterprise in the airline industry. Uh, I think at one point, Pan Am had the entire Pacific locked up. All routes of the Pacific had to be Pan Am. Nobody else could compete. I think it was only, I forget now which, I think Pan Am was a Republican airline and, and TWA was the Democratic. I think, um, or vice versa. I think, yeah, I think that's what it is. When Democrats came in, they allowed TWA to fly on that route. So, uh, and uh, there still is, by the way, a very powerful international airline cartel, IATA, the International Airline something Association, Trans Transport Association, something like that which has a lockup on all the European flights. And those of you who have ever flown to Europe will see that, to your horror, that it's, it's more expensive to fly from London to Frankfurt than this from the United States to New York to London, <laughs> because the, the inter-European inter flights in Europe uh, are locked up by a very, a very powerful intergovernmental cartel, which used to be, which the United States is now probably, has probably busted, has been busted inside the United States and for American Airlines. Um, the... Uh, <clears throat> So, the, so in other words, you have a rationing situation. You, you assign routes. You exclude everybody except one or two airlines from each, from each route. Uh, you lock up particularly the major routes, the most profitable routes, and, and jack up the price. Now, originally, say in the 19, I think by the, as late as the 1950s, there was no such thing as first class and tourist. All classes were first class. Everything was very, was very extremely expensive. What you had then was... Uh, Heroic little airlines. They were, they were names like Transamerica and Continental. Was another uh, Transcontinental. Transcontinental. They were competing, and they were small airlines. Another thing you have to realize, which we'll deal with, emphasize in this course too: a big air, a big company doesn't, doesn't necessarily outcompete a small one. Sometimes small competitors are more more efficient. And so, uh, in this case, the small airlines came in. They started outcompeting the big ones by offering cheaper service and a no-frill service. This is the days before People's Express. Um, and immediately the CAB and the behest of the airlines comes in and puts them, prohibits them from scheduling their flights. <clears throat> in other words, says, okay, from now on, you guys, there's no safety problem, by the way. Sa safety is the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, CAB was purely in charge of economic monopoly, um, part of the airline business. And uh, these guys, were, they had a very good safety record, much better than the big airlines per, per mile flown. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but they, the CAB said, well, you guys are unfair competitors. We won't allow you to schedule your flights. In other words, they couldn't have any timetable. They had to sit there on the, on the, air, on the, on the, on the, on the running runway until they filled up. So they could only say, well, we're flying on Tuesday. They couldn't say we're flying on Tuesday at 11 a.m. They're prohibited by, by the law, by the CAB, from doing that. Even so, so, they were called the non-SCEDs, the non-scheduled airlines. Even as non-SCEDs, they were able to outcompete. They were able to fly people from New York to L.A., let's say, for half the price of the of United or American or TWA. They were very good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, effectively, how much the consumers are willing to, to go for it. Right? And there was a cut down on the consumer demand, obviously, for so they don't know you can they don't know when you're going to leave in the, during the day. Right. But even so, even with a non-sked uh, repression by the CAB, they were still out competing and doing very well. They were cutting the price literally in half, fair. Now, it's, it's true there were no frills. Some of these outfits, um, 
used to weigh you along with the, the luggage. There's a, a maximum weight of you plus the luggage. For those of us who are on the heavy set side, we felt it was kind of, kind of discrimination. <laughs> Still, in a while, you're paying as a trade off. In other words, in return for getting for the ignominy of getting weighed, <laughs> uh, you also, you know, cost you a lot less. Um, I remember my wife flew from Los Angeles to New York on a non I think it was Transamerica, and it was, it was very cheap. It was, it was not free, it was kind of scary in the sense that they, they said, well, from, uh, at one point they announced, uh, please everybody go to the, the back of the, of the plane, <laughs> that sort of thing. It didn't, didn't give you a feeling of great confidence. Also, at one point, there was a leak in the plane. It was raining outside. There was a leak in the, in the ceiling of the, of the, of the plane. The stewardess very with great aplomb went up there and took, took a Band-Aid and put it on the, <laughs> the leak. So it's kind of a raffish. <laughs> Raffish Airline it doesn't give you great security. On the other hand, they had a very good safety record. They had no crashes, I remember. And, and they forced, they were the ones, it was the, it was the competition of Transamerica and Transcontinental that forced the big five to finally create a, 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 a coach section along with the first class section, to cut, their, cut their, their fares in the rear of the plane in half. Was, that was in the 1950s. It was them that did it. The heroic battle competition of these little airlines that forced America and United Airlines and, and, and TWA and so forth to, to finally create a second class fare system. Uh, finally, what the CAB is, they f simply put them out of business. They forced them out of business. And from now on, you can't fly anymore. That was the end of that. The end of poor Transamerica and Transcontinental and the rest of it. <clears throat> um, and there, was a, uh, there was another plane that went to Europe. I forget the airline. Friends of mine used to go on when they were students. They would, they would fly to Iceland and Luxembourg. And it would land in the United States, it would land somewhere in a field in New Hampshire. <laughs> and you make your way to New York <laughs> by train or bus or something. Anyway, it was, again, very cheap, much cheaper than the, uh, than the uh, official fares in that period. So what happens is, in other words, these planes had minimum, their, their rates were kept up. They were set by the CAB to a very high rate. Uh, also, they, there's all sorts of ways to compete. Now, if you can't compete on the basis of price, you compete on the basis of quality of service, of thrills. And so um, you start giving you know more, better better food or uh, swankier uh, portions, prettier stewardesses, and so and all these, these became the methods of competition rather than price. Uh, at one point, IATA cracked down and said, uh, from now on, no more meals, no more hot meals on airline on, 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 on transatlantic flights. You can only have sandwiches. No more hot meals. No more you know real dinners. And so what the individual airlines started to do, in order to break the cartel, they started having, uh, okay, we're only having sandwiches. They had open face sandwiches. They take the whole you know, beef burger and put them on a piece of bread and call it a sandwich. <laughs> so this way, getting around the crazy cartel regulation. <laughs> so all these, this, it, uh, economic history, by the way, history of, of government and the economy is essentially a history of, of the government versus the market. The government puts on crazy regulations, the market tries to get around it. We've seen with price control and so forth. Same thing is working here with monopoly, uh, monopoly uh, privileges. Uh, you put on a regulation, you have to keep the price up. Then, then the airlines start competing in things like, like better meals. Then, you, then the cartel tries to crack down on the meal and say, no, you can only serve sandwiches, and they serve open face sandwiches. They have the whole meal on top of a piece of bread and call it a sandwich. That was, <laughs> um, the, uh, <clears throat> what finally began, began to happen with the airlines is they became, if you're a monopoly, you get a very high profit. Okay. But eventually, in the long run, the, the profit gets, gets competed away and basis to higher costs. In other words, what then happens is, in other words, you have a high demand curve, high profits, then increase your demand curve for, for workers, for raw material, for whatever, and the, and the prices start going up. And what, you have, what happened is you had a very high salary, for example, for pilots and stewardesses, much, for, much higher for these big airlines than anybody else, from the, from the non-scheduled types. Uh, very high costs, plush offices, and great, great enormous amount of inefficiency. He wound up after about 40 years of this, with the airlines losing money anyway, even though they were monopolistic, even though they were restricted, and so forth and so on. They're still losing money. This, by the way, was what happened with, with, the, tra with the trains and, and railroads in general. Uh, railroads were overbuilt. They were then regulated. Their, their fares were kept up. Uh, the Rates were kept up by the Interstate Commerce Commission. And finally, after many decades of this, they started losing money, even though they were getting privileged by the ICC. Losing money as monopolists, because monopolists tend to get in inefficient. And uh, so you wound up with these, these airlines losing money anyway. Uh, and uh, finally, when the move for deregulation came in the late, late years of the Carter administration, 1978, 
the airlines are almost ready for it. So I don't know how well they we'll have to we'll have to try something new. And so they more or less went along with it, even though reluctantly, because monopoly just wasn't working, finally. Just, they were just losing money anyway. And they began to realize maybe we'd do better under deregulation, even though they weren't happy about it. They were still ready. Their, their love for, for monopoly had more or less withered away after, after 40 years of this. And as a result of deregulation, we have tremendous changes in the airline industry. Some lines have gone, went bankrupt. Other lines have popped up as new and effective competitors, like People's Express. We, again, with People's Express, it's much, less, it's much cheaper. On the other hand, you have to realize that you know, you're not quite sure when they're going to take off, because they might sit there loading up, et cetera. So, uh, and you realize that, and you, see, you, you pay for the difference. Uh, so various outfits have been involved, a lot of reshuffling in the airline industry, plus the invention of the hub and spoke thing, which came about only by market, began to realize it's more efficient to have hub, in, hub cities like Denver, let's say. So instead of having a lot of nonstop flights, say, from New York to Los Angeles, you stop at Denver, you stop at Houston, and have a, a lot of uh, airlines coming in from, from other cities, coming into Denver and then going out again. Nobody could, could have predicted in advance this is what would happen. This is, only came about as a result of the market, market forces, where it turned out that this is the most efficient way of doing it. So at any rate, this is, uh, so in the long run, even the monopolists begin to lose out in the situation, but uh, it, it often takes, you know, half a century to do that. Okay, that's uh, enough for today. Uh, <clears throat> keep you up on the news, uh, since the, uh, shh, quiet, keep you up on the news since the term has started, <clears throat> the, um, you might have noticed if you get if you get Time Magazine, the current issue of Time Magazine is a front cover. It says, I think it's, yeah, it says oil price, cheap oil, good news, and then underneath has a uh, headline, cheap oil, bad news, and then has a typical Time type discussion, which is very middle of the road, quoting having quotes from both sides saying uh, the cheap oil good, cheap oil, cheap oil bad. The latest political flap is Vice President Bush, who said, uh, who is indeed a Texas oil man. Um, who came out in favor of raising the price of oil, or so, quote, stabilizing it, thereby violating the current principles of the Reagan administration. There's a big flap on that. <clears throat> so here we have a situation. The price of oil has magnificently fallen from uh, 30 bucks a barrel, $35 a barrel years, several years ago, to about $10 a barrel now, something like that. In real terms, since the price of uh, oil, uh, prices in general have tripled in the last 20 years, this means... It's uh, the equivalent of about $3 a barrel in 1967 or so. So it's more or less what it was, in real terms, uh, corrected for inflation, it's more or less what it was uh, before the OPEC uh, Arab oil explosion in the early 70s. <clears throat> a little bit higher, but more or less the same. Um, so what happens with any price change is hysteria hits. In other words, whatever, whether the price is going up or down, most of the establishment, most of the media is attacking it. Terrible thing will cause inflation or depression or whatever the heck it is. I can't, it can't be, they can't both be right. It couldn't have been a terrible thing to raise the price of oil from three bucks to 35. And, and also terrible to go down to 10. Right? I mean, it's, 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 you can't have it both ways. Uh, unless you take a position, any change whatsoever is bad, which needs to be an idiotic position to take. Uh, <laughs> So what's the real story here? It's true that the Texans don't like the fact, Texans love the fact that the price of oil is 35. If you're a Texas oil man, uh, you love the $35 an ounce uh, barrel, excuse me, $35, <laughs> $35 barrel uh, crude oil price. Uh, you don't like it going down to 10. On the other hand, who cares about Texas oil man? Why should they set the standard for how we decide something, how we judge it? The standard of all these things should be judged. The way to look at it is you don't go take take Gallup polls and ask the Texas congressman and ask the New England congressman. What you do is you figure out where the consumers stand on this thing. In other words, the whole point of production, the whole point of an economy in general is, a, is for consumption. The whole point of producing oil is that eventually it gets to the consumer in the form of kerosene, gasoline, or whatever, <clears throat> heating oil, whatever they use for. Um, and so the whole point of production is that over time, from the, from the days of the caveman until the present, more and more consumer wants are being satisfied. The standard of living keeps going up. Uh, everything gets cheaper and more abundant. In other words, the, the, the choices available to the consumer keep improving and increasing, and, 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 and the new products come on the market and old products get cheaper. <clears throat> that's the whole point of, of production. That, that's what increased standard of living means. So consumers can get more and more goods and services. <clears throat> so, so we know then what the, how, to, how to judge any change up or down of a dollar 
and price is whatever. Namely, cheaper is better, period. Of course, if you have maximum price control, you screw everything up. So I'm talking about cheaper on the free market. Cheaper is an expression of increased supply, okay? of breaking cartels. The cartels are breaking out. We're going to cartels today. Um, cartels deliberately restrict production and raise prices. The breaking up of a cartel, what's been happening in the last couple of years with OPEC, means the consumers are enjoying the benefit of cheaper oil and, and lower prices. Cheaper is better. Okay? And that's, that, that solves the problem. It's better to have uh, computers on your lap for whatever it is, $35 or whatever the computer is, than to have it uh, plug into a mainframe of $2 million or whatever. So all these things, better, cheaper is better. That's what you're holding, holding to your heart, which is, of course, what the average person's reaction is anyway. What you find in economics is that basically the average person's immediate reaction is usually correct. Unfortunately, the average person's reaction is often overlarded with phony economics and bad advice they get from the media. So, uh, so cheaper is better. Cheaper gasoline is better. Cheaper fuel oil is better. All the rest of it. Now, the, notice some of the phony arguments you get. Well, the trouble with cheaper oil is that people use much of, a lot of it and then it'll get more expensive. Well, and then we worry about it after that. You know, I mean, you, you take each thing a day at a time. <laughs> You don't say you have to jack up the price of oil now, re-establish re the cartel, which is essentially what Bush wants to do, and raise the price of oil so that it, to avoid an increase in the price of oil 10 years from now. I mean, the, whole, the whole concept is nuts. I mean, looking at it as a, as a, as a logical argument, the whole thing is full of prunes. And the only, time, the only reason people advance the argument is not because they believe it. Nobody can believe. Nobody, no rational person can believe it's what we should do is to force the price of oil up now because eventually in 10 years it might go up by itself. Right? That, that's an argument so ridiculous, nobody can really hold it. These arguments are advanced for, for sinister economic interest. By sinister, I mean, against, I mean against the public interest. So those who want to reestablish the cartel, jack up the price of oil, and, and, and lower and cut the supply, uh, which the Texas oil people want to do, of course. <clears throat> and uh, so it's, very, it's, not, it's not a muddled situation. You don't have to be in the middle of a rotor on this thing. You don't have to take gallop poles from everybody. It's, it should be crystal clear that cheaper is better. <clears throat> and... Um, and finally, the oil people are finally getting their comeuppance, the OPEC types. Uh, and, and the classic method by which cartels always get comeuppance. Okay, let's get into that. The cartel of the situation where, uh, where suppliers of any sort, and we're going to go through various examples of this, suppliers of, of medical services, suppliers of a taxi service, suppliers of oil, it doesn't really make any difference. They try to band together. Here's the supply and here's the man to restrict the supply and raise the price, taking advantage of an alleged inelastic demand curve. Assume, let's assume that the demand curve for the industry is inelastic. We know, of course, the demand curve for every firm is elastic. It's fairly flat. So they can't, in each individual, if Wonder Bread, let's say you want to have a bread cartel. If Wonder Bread tried to raise the price to two bucks a loaf, nobody's going to buy it, except a couple of Wonder Bread, very wealthy Wonder Bread fanatics. Everybody else will shift the Pepperidge Farm or, or Silver Tasty Bread or whatever. But if all the bread firms get together and try to raise the price, they try to go up their industry demand curve and thereby increase the alleged, let's assume we have an inelastic demand curve. It doesn't have to be inelastic. But in those industries where the demand curve is inelastic, firms are tempted to try to restrict production and raise the price, thereby benefiting each firm and screwing the consumer. <clears throat> now, most people think that it's easy to have a cartel. Most people think, I think the average person, in this case, the average person is the wrong instincts. At the uh, let's say General Electric and Westinghouse, which is essentially a two-person, a two-firm electrical industry, um, two major firms of electrical industry, and the vice president of each gets together over a union league club or something, and they're having a cocktail, and they're saying, well, and one says to the other, hey Jim, why don't we increase our price by 20 percent, and we'll both do it, and we'll, we'll have an inelastic demand curve, we'll have an increased profits, and, and Jim says that's a great idea, Joe, and at the end of it, it's not the end of it. It's very difficult to establish a cartel, even without, even without forgetting about antitrust. Uh, laws. And the reason is this. It's easy for both, say, Westinghouse and General Electric to say, hey, let's raise the price. That's great. But in order to, to have a viable rise in price, in order to be able to do it, they have to cut production. In other words, whatever it is, 10%, 15 whatever it is, each one has to agree to cut production in order to have this joint rise in price. Every businessman hates to cut production. They hate, they hate in their gut to cut production. What they want to do is incre increase production. Every businessman wants to expand his operation. He doesn't want to cut them. And so this, this is a goal in the heart of every businessman. So to, to form a cartel is a very difficult process, causing 
a great deal of negotiations, even, even when it's legal, even when there's no antitrust problem. Months of negotiation. Well, we have to cut production. How much do we cut production? And each one says, well, all right, let's say you have to have a base year. Okay, let's say 1985 is the base year. Let's say both parties or two or three firms in the industry, they each agree to cut production by 15%. Well, they can do that, but you see, over time, and the time doesn't have to be very long, in a year or so, each one will think, Jesus, why am I restricted to 1985? 1985 is getting to be obsolete. I've got new machines. I've got better equipment. I've got new products. Why should I be bound by 1985 when I can, I know darn well if I expand production, I can outcompete these guys now, I can get a bigger share of the market. Each firm tends to believe that because if you're in business, you have to be an optimist to be an entrepreneur. You're spending a lot of money, investing a lot of money, and pessimists don't, don't last long in business. So most businessmen are optimistic. And most businessmen are chafing in the bit. Why should I be restricted by 1985, which is now three years ago? And so the, the cartel quotas tend to be busted. In other words, each Businessman, they try to renegotiate. They say, well, I've got a better product. I'm, I want to increase my production this year. And the other guy says, no, you can't do that. You're violating a quota. And often the quota then breaks up. The whole agreement breaks up in mutual recrimination and hatred. And you're back down again. Okay, so this is, it's very difficult to maintain sustained quotas of this sort over time. And also, in addition to that, each firm has a tremendous temptation to cheat. Here they are. They've restricted production by 15%. They have a higher price, they're each making better, higher profits. Each one says, boy, if I can only pick up, if I can cut, product, cut my price to the suppliers secretly, I can pick up enormous uh, increase in product. I can go down my firm demand curve and, and get, make millions. Okay. So he goes to a supplier, or the other guy's client says, look, Jim, I'll give you a secret discount, rebate of 15% or 20%, if you don't tell Westinghouse about it, whatever. Because okay. we have this a cartel agreement to keep prices up and cut production. So each firm has a temptation to cheat. The temptation is enormous. And they cheat and they have a secret rebate. I don't mean an illegal rebate in the sense of, of, of the, the, the manager stealing from the company. I mean a simple rebate where you say, look, I'll send you, I'll, I'll give you this, I'll send you this product, though, electrical product, whatever it is, for 15% less, but don't tell anybody. <clears throat> so because I don't want to violate my agreement with General Electric or Westinghouse or whatever. So each one cheats. It takes, you know, after about six months, everybody spies on everybody else, and they find out the other guy cheats, and the whole cartel breaks up in mutual hatred, and they're back down again, except now they have to hate each other. <clears throat> so every, so this is one of, it's a tremendous pressure on every cartel to cheat and to break up in general, to break up the code agreements and to cheat as time goes on. In many cases in railroads, when railroads are the big business in the 19th century, one guy would own two railroads, and he couldn't get the team. He'd form a pool, a cartel, let's say the three railroads, two of which was owned by the same guy. He couldn't get his own managers not to cheat, because the sales, the vice president in charge of sales, his whole life is, is devoted to increasing sales. He hates like hell to cut sales. And they, so each guy comp was competing against the other railroad, even though, even though there was one tycoon who owned both of them. They still cheated, they still busted the cartel. So even when one guy owns both companies, it's very difficult to get your sales managers or sales vice presidents to go along the idea of restricting sales. So as a result, cartels break up from internal pressure. Number one, the two things which break up every cartel, one is internal pressure, this sort of pressure to cheat, to, to violate your, to go down your firm demand curve, you have making big profits, boy, if I can only cut my, secretly cut prices by 20%, I can pick up enormous business. And the second reason is, here you have a, two or three firms get together and raise production, uh, cut production and raise prices and increase profits. There's a lot of loose capital around, a lot of capitalists in the world who have a lot of money they want to, like to invest. And they're looking around for, for profitable investments. They see, hey, there's this industry here, electrical machinery or railroads, whatever it happens to be, or sugar refining. The industry's making high profits. They've got this little cartel going, let's go in and bust it. And let's go in and put it with a new plant, new equipment, and undercut the cartel. So a new capitalist come in, they create a, have a new railroad or a new plant, and the, and the, new, the old firms are now confronted with this new plant with better equipment, because it's you know, starting from scratch, you're going to use all the modern equipment. And then they're faced with the question, either they have to cut these guys into the cartel, the new firm, which means they have to cut their own production by 30% or something, or else the whole cartel gets busted, you back down again to, to square zero. So this is external pressure. In other words, new firms coming in, with, with brand new factories and all that to, to break up the cartel, external pressure. And when you have an external pressure, when a new sugar refining plant comes in or a new shoe production plant or a new railroad or whatever, 
The new firm is there permanently. In other words, here's the, the two or three firms in the, in the industry. They cut production and raise prices. The result is a new firm comes in with better equipment, out-competing them. They're back down to square zero, except they, they got a fourth firm which is out-competing them and driving them to the wall. So no firm likes to do this. No industry likes to have an umbrella, a high-profit umbrella, to invite new unwelcome competitors into the, into the industry. So external pressure, internal, internal pressure, broken up. Every cartel, I'm going on a limb, every cartel in the history of the world has broken up on the free market. Very quickly broken up. And that doesn't take very long either. A year or two. Cartel has to break up. The only thing which can sustain a cartel is government intervention to, to compulsory cartels to keep external, keep the price up, keep production limited, and keep new firms from coming in. This is the compulsory, where the government comes in and forces a cartel. That's the essence of what we're living under right now, basically the welfare state or the war, welfare, warfare state, whatever you want to call it. It's essentially a cartelizing state. The government intervenes to try to cartelize different industries. 